The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. Hey everyone, good to be back here. Sorry for any delay, I am a little bit late, but... Anyway, I'm gonna hop right in with a question. If you have young children, let's say under five, do you play Disney movies for them? Or do you read books to them with, you know, talking dogs or talking cats or talking hamsters, you know, just talking animals? Uh, do you have your kids watch superhero movies, maybe alongside you or even on their own? Batman, Superman, I don't know, Ant-Man, whatever superhero man or superhero woman is out today. Uh, if you do, well, you know, you're a horrible person. Okay, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But in all seriousness, today, what we will be talking about, uh, it might get you rethinking some of that fantasy, or at least I'd say the amount you might expose your children to it. With me sharing her take on all of this, so fantasy and children, uh, pretend play, imagination, that type of thing, and then definitely related to Montessori, is the old school Montessorian Ginny Sackett. Uh, she has been here before, if you've been listening along, and she has been in Montessori, uh, I mean, since literally before I was born. So she began as a very skeptical Montessori parent. Later, uh, in 1982, she earned her AMI diploma for 36-year-olds. Uh, if you're not familiar, AMI is the Association Montessori Internationale. That's the organization originally started by Maria Montessori herself. Uh, again, if you've been listening to the show, you already know uh, who Jenny Sackett is. But after getting her Montessori training, she taught in the classroom for, I think it was a dozen years at the three to six level. She later became an AMI teacher trainer. I can't tell you how much work goes into becoming a teacher trainer. It's hard enough to become a Montessori teacher, a fully trained teacher. Uh, to be a trainer is just so much work. Anyhow, she then, after that, served as director of training at Montessori Northwest in Portland, Oregon, and she did that for some 15 years, and then, you know, if that wasn't enough, she really went on to the big leagues, and she became the director of pedagogy for all of AMI, and that's out in Amsterdam. She is now retired, uh, happily retired, as she says, and uh, this basically, this woman's credentials are through the roof. Oh, yeah, and she wanted me to note that she has an essay out in a new book or relatively new book called Perspectives on Montessori. Uh, she wants to support the Dutch editors of that book. So go ahead and check that one out. Um, as you know, if you listen to the show, you know, all these credentials, books, people write at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter unless you are good with children. And I'm not talking on paper good, but you know, in real life for me, Jenny is exceptional in that regard. And Really importantly, since she's been out of the classroom for such a long time, she is exceptional with adults. And it's hard to find people that are good with adults. So I find that many times teachers are, you can find very good with children, and then they're just a hot mess <laughs> with us adults. Jenny's not that. She is a rock star, and I appreciate her coming back on the show. Always love to have her on here. So let's get to it. Fantasy and children, and uh, let's see what she's got to say. Jenny Sackett, happy to have you on another time. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for keep asking me. <laughs> yes, for sure. So we're just going to get right into it. Fantasy. Uh, I'll tell you, this is probably top three question I get asked emails, you know, on comments and so forth. Like, what is up with Montessori and fantasy? You know, this idea, I don't know where each parent gets it from or each teacher when they ask the question, but it's basically you know, is Montessori anti-fantasy with children? Um, you know, what what's going on there, basically? So what do you think? What do I think? Well, you know, I, I think um, a place to start is let's define what we mean by fantasy, because it's possible that people are using the word in different different ways. When I think of fantasy, you know, it's obviously an aspect of imagination. And imagination, we call it a human tendency. So obviously, we think it's a good thing. Um, but a common part of the definition of fantasy is to imagine things that are impossible or improbable, that they're not likely to happen in the real world. They, they couldn't happen in reality. So if we can agree, first of all, that that's what we're talking about. We're talking about 
things that are imagined that you know couldn't actually happen in the real world. So what do you like? What are some examples of this? Fantasy well, that we so can all for example, for? Um, well, a lot of what's presented as entertainment, whether it's cartoons or Teletubbies or whatever the current version of that you know of that kind of thing is, um, sci-fi movies. You know, the thing about fantasy is that typically as we age, as we become adults, we know it's fantasy. We like, I'm sure when sci-fi movies are made, everybody involved knows a lot of the stuff in this movie could never really happen in, in the real world. Um, but it's part of, it's, it's kind of fun. But the young children, they don't know that yet. They don't know what is, you know, they're, they're still sorting out what is real and, and what does that mean? So they they accept whatever we have. Like I remember hearing um, Kay Baker talk about um, Montessori trainer um, that something like Santa Claus is the product of a, an adult imagination. But when we tell when we share that with the child, a young child, all they get is the product. They they just they they sort of have. And Montessori talked about that young children have credulity. They believe what they're told. They believe what what comes to them. So they're still trying to sort that out. So I think that's why we get confused in how we want to approach this idea of fantasy. So, I think a lot so a lot of Montessorians get very rigid about it. No fantasy, you know. But let's. We could probably talk more about that. <laughs> so are you, I mean, when we talk about Montessori, then if a parent's out there just being like, you know, so what you're basically saying that Montessori doesn't want fantasy for children. Then. If it's created by an adult, it's exact. It's, we don't want it. Is that, is that what you're saying? Or what, what do you think? I don't know if, if it's practical even to say that, because we, we, we can't stop. We fantasize all the time. We humans, mm -hmm. it's like a leap from the imagination you could think about it like, is it good or bad for children, young children to, to be exposed to fantasy? Um, and I think that we have to be cautious. So I'm going to, I'm going to give an, I'm going to give a little example, a little story. Like I said, adult humans know pretty much what is real and what isn't. So we might fantasize about jumping out of a window and flying, you know, have a little fantasy about it. But fortunately, um, we adults or older children even know about gravity. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. So if I actually jump out of a window and fly, I won't fly, I'm going, you know, it could be dangerous. So a, a story I read somewhere, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a great little anecdote. So the, the English writer, um, James M. Barry first wrote Peter Pan in 1904. And in the original, he portrayed exactly that, that Peter just led the children um, to the window and said, think happy thoughts. And then they all would fly off to Neverland. But um, unfortunately, there were young children who saw this or heard about it, and they took the example quite literally, and they tried the same thing. And of course, the outcome was rather disastrous and horrible for those children leaping out of windows. They didn't fly. Um, so what Barry did is he added the fairy dust to the story as necessary in order to fly. You can't just think the happy thought you, you have to have the fairy dust. And that helped children realize that, you know, they couldn't jump out of windows and fly. Um, but anyway, it's, I don't know if that helps a little bit that, 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 you know, young children are still trying to sort out reality and, yeah. In our work with young children under the age of six, um, that's really the, the role of Montessori education. It, Montessori said that the you know children in the first plane up to age six, they wrap their hands around the world. Um, the child older than six wraps his mind around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's very different. So it's more about what's appropriate, what's best. I, yeah. I think that we as the educators with young children, a good, a general guideline is to just stay close to reality in what we do. The books we read, the stories we tell, the songs we sing, poetry can push a few limits, but not too many. We provide reality. So uh, maybe you can, I, I don't, I have a quote that was like, 
way back, I wrote it down, so I cannot find the source, but it's actually related to what you were saying. It, supposedly from Montessori, in my own words here, but so we help a child fly by helping while he is on the earth. And I don't, I, I can't find the source, but it sounds yeah. like, you know, what you're basically getting at is that by offering them more and more understanding about the world, about reality, it allows them later to kind of create fantasy and imagination, and all these amazing things. But if they don't first have, you know, their grounding in their feet, they can, yeah. you know, jump out of a window per se, or do something yeah. else that's, right. you know, out, outrageous or even just confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of yeah. like Montessori would be reality first. Is that how you frame it? Or yeah, I think that if you think about the the first playing child and what they're creating, uh, they're creating their imaginations. Uh, imagination is going to be a power for the older child. The Montessori environment for an older child is built around exploration through their imaginations. Montessori writes about that in um, a couple different places, you know, from childhood to adolescence and in the advanced method one, she writes a lot about this idea. This imagination doesn't come out of nowhere for the six-year-old, it's built. It's like coordination of movement, it's built. And we want to give the best opportunities and experiences and conditions possible for that power to be created. And so just as with control of movement, we're going to provide that environment and the experiences and the opportunities um, to, you know, to really develop a, a really high level of coordinated movement. We want to offer the experiences for the imagination. So imagination is built on abstractions. Abstractions are what we create out of our real experience. Once the abstraction, you know, you, you manipulate something, you experience something, it becomes an abstraction in the mind. Usually it's labeled with language. That's how we know it's there. And now these abstractions can start interacting and get recombined. And that's where the imagination comes from. So we don't have to impose anything mm -hmm. on the for the child to have an imagination. They're going to do that work, just like we can't we can't learn to walk for them. We can't, you know, they have to, they have to do the work to walk. Mm -hmm. They do the work to create their imagination and the better the conditions for that, the, the better the outcome. So let me, I'm thinking about this in terms of a parent context, what I've gotten or seen teachers ask uh -huh. questions. So just this idea that it seems like you're going to, let's say we're helping children to understand big versus small or large versus mm -hmm. small and so <laughs> forth. So shapes. And then they might go outside in the playground and see a big rock and that's mom. And then a smaller rock is the child. And that's fine. That's the kind of imagination with the rocks, but we would never go out there and go, here's a family. And it's a big rock is the mom. And, and there's the dog with a little leaf or something. We wouldn't impose that and say, here's your family. But if a child does that through their own imagination, learning shapes and sizes, uh -huh. that's completely fine and, and great. I think that's a great example. There's so many examples because because now actually you're kind of going into pretend play mm -hmm. um, as an outcome. And if we go out and say, here's the mama rock and here's the daddy rock and here's the baby rock, we don't know if every child's mind that's hearing this from me as the adult is ready for that. Mm -hmm. But if the child does it spontaneously, that's telling you there's something they've experienced. and. I think pretend play is also not completely understood in Montessori. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, we have, let's see, how will I get to this? All right. It's pretend play starts really young. Um, I'm going to tell a little story. So I recently watched my 18 month old grandson and in his house, they have this little pretend miniature kitchen, no judgment. It's what they have. <laughs> and he, I was watching him, observing him. And he goes over to this little kitchen, he's playing, and he hold, takes this little miniature cup, it's a real cup, it's a miniature cup, and he holds it under the pretend faucet, and he very carefully turns the faucet's knob as if filling the cup with water, then turned off the faucet, then pretended to drink the non-existent water from the empty cup. And he repeated that several times. Mm -hmm. Now... Observing that tells me he has some basic understanding um, of the dynamics of getting real water at a real sink with running water. 
So he is building this pretend off of something that is real and he has really experienced. And it's almost like the pretend play is proving I have this abstraction in my brain because I can now mix it up and, and you know, mm -hmm. by so now if 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 this was a child who lived in another culture that didn't have such a sink um, with running water, he would not have come up with this particular pretend play. Um, he might have had a different version of getting a drink of water modeled on how how their people do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever a child experiences directly or vicariously through images can be a prompt for pretend. And I would rather leave it to the child to do it in their own time and way than impose pretend play on the child does that make sense yeah and so you know this just got me thinking like maybe like the ancient times when a you know even pre kind of civilization times when somebody's say the adult men are going out to hunt or if there's that rare tribe where the woman goes out to hunt yeah. obviously you don't want a three-year-old going on the hunt with you because it's very very dangerous but mm -hmm. back home it seems in some tribes the children would pretend that they're hunting yeah. and in some way that's getting them prepared for the actual hunt um yeah if, in, yeah which is in our case to the extent possible when you can make it real why add the pretend like us adding the pretend right there so, there there's yeah. a necessity with you know water the child could be attempting to use the water himself uh, from the real faucet um, yeah so and that's what that's what so like for our what we would do so I think of this as part of the child adapting to their time and place. Mm -hmm. There's so much they have to sort out in this place. They suddenly find themselves. Um, this universal child needs is, is now with this task of adapting to this time, this place, this culture, this technology, you know, whatever. And so pretend is a way for children to further explore and rehearse almost re uh, what what happens in the real world, uh, what they've observed and experienced. And so you can't stop it, apparently. I mean, it starts really young. Yeah. Uh, as soon as they've absorbed enough of something, they will rehearse it and repeat it. Um, now, what we do in our Montessori environments is we give them the real thing. We give them you know real objects scaled to their size and their capacities, um, accessible water source. And we guide them to do the real thing, get their own water. Um, it doesn't mean they're never going to pretend to get water mm -hmm. or make a game out of pretending about water, but but we're we are making sure that they're um they're also like continuing that exploration with the real objects while they're still so young. I wonder yeah. if do you think the the kind of fundamentalism that we're not the ones because a lot of this pretend play naturally arises from the child as you've kind of suggested with some mm -hmm. of this stuff but then again with the fantasy like to the extent that they're coming up with things why would we ever want to like put oh no put that away don't don't oh. pretend that that stick is a spatula you know um right but to yeah. the extent that we can give them real experiences why not do that where they can explore with that and then you know if they want to i don't know sword fight or whatnot if they, you know we're not going to give them yeah. real swords at two years old because that would be yeah. dangerous um, right so with that you think that's the kind of basis the difference between the the adult imposing it as you would put it versus the child coming up with it yeah i think um i don't know when the child is ready the child shows me he's ready by his by the pretend coming spontaneously from him um and he's going to i mean if you really observe pretend they you can source any pretend to a real experience now the mm -hmm. real experience the one that monasterians really might get a little um have difficulty with shall i say is they've been given some kind of an experience called dragons or you uh, know teletubbies or yeah. what was the whatever. purple guy's name i don't know remember I, that big purple <laughs> purple well, i can't i can't forget his name now it was like that right. song that went along yeah. with him but yeah. yeah yeah so anyway someone has provided them an experience and they can take it in through images you know pictures we know that children can learn about animals just from pictures at a very young age they don't need to see the actual animal they will take their experience can include images and then this is where we adults share with them 
these images and stories that are not based in reality, or at least not the reality of today, but they've accepted it. And this is the credulity that Montessori mm. talks about. It's like, yeah, they take it as whatever. And so um, a child might come into your room, a three-year-old, and be really excited about dragons. And they might know a lot about dragons and want to talk about dragons. And I think the worst thing we could do as as caring educators is to say, no, we don't talk about dragons here. Yeah. Dragons aren't real. I mean, boom, talk about what are you doing to this child? You know, they have been given every reason to believe that this is something real and exciting and important. Maybe they have wonderful conversations, book reading with their parents about dragons. You know, it's part of their family. They watch, you know, cartoons about dragons. Who knows? So why would you stomp on that? But what we want to do is provide some of the counterbalance of like, um, well, where do you, you know, what do you know? And actually, I think the best thing we can do when a child comes in and wants to talk about something is to just go into two modes. One is sort of our tell me more mode. Oh, dragons. Tell me about dragons. What do you know about dragons? You know, find out what they're thinking. What do they have to say about them? Do they know that they, they might already know that they're not real, <laughs> but they're just a wonderful thing that they love to pretend about. So anyway, I, I think, uh, tell me more, sort of our question game that we have in our language area, mm. you know, sort of who, what, where, when, how, uh, but do it in a very conversational way, not a, an interrogation, you know, and just sort of like, I like to try to be dumb as the adults, like dragons, really? Tell me about dragons, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I, and of course, dragons, I'm using this example because I used to use this in my training. Dragons are a part of a lot of human cultures. They have different appearances. They've had a really important role in human cultures. Um, and one of the remnants of that is that there's all these animals in the world that we put dragon into their name. So that could be a link. You, you, you listen to what the child knows, and then you say, oh, well, what do I have to myself? I asked, what mm -hmm. do I have that could link this to something, you know, to become a, a, a stimulus. This is the child's interested in this. We build on interests. So I would put together a, a set of cards, which was just all the different kinds of animals that have dragon in their name and learn about that, their names and, and learn about where they live and, you know, sort of just like widen the perspective, but I'm never, I'm not going to tell the child, don't talk about that. Yeah. And the one thing is that I have found like uh, another story, um, my, my another one of my grandsons when he was wait wait four. Jenny before you get this I have oh, yeah. to, you when I heard your original dragon story I remember the way that you presented I was like you told the child like you know what I've actually seen a dragon yeah and then the, the, I'm like and I was listening to this like where the hell's Jenny going with this she's seen a dragon and and you're like this one's at the zoo so it was just such like you you brought the child into this like he's like wait a second he's like I know there's no dragon like it was almost like you knew he knew there wasn't dragons but you wanted to do it was such a yeah, good yeah that's why I say we, we, stay, we stay yeah we stay literal and kind of dumb yeah, so but I, had, well, I was when I was in Australia I went to the zoo in Sydney and they had this amazing Komodo dragons I mean these yeah. are impressive they deserve the name dragon and the way but the way you drew the child into me is like that's the spirit of yeah. like Let's get yeah. him back to learning about the world, but don't push down his interests, his desires, his feeling, you know, so right. anyway, well, so and, I and cut and you off. Really make his family. Yeah. And so, yeah, then I, I, I happen to have a picture of the Komodo dragon. I'm going to bring it to you tomorrow and we talk about it. And, um, I don't know what the child would say, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, they often know, you know, like it, it, it doesn't one of the things we want to find out is how literal is this for the child? If it's very mm -hmm. literal, I don't want to destroy this child's sense of their self-worth or yeah. possibly their relationships within their family or alienate the family yeah. by, by coming, coming across in this very like, we don't talk about dragons here. Don't you dare talk about dragons. I think it's like the same thing with like even clothing. You know, the child comes in with a superhero shirt on. Um, you know, I'm not going to make him take it off and turn it inside out. That How humiliating is that? But I might decide to have this kind of question game like conversation. Like uh, if if it's attracting any attention at all, if it's not attracting any attention, forget about it. Yeah. You know, if children aren't clustering around and being like, 
you know, all distracted by it. But if they were, I would just say, oh, you seem really interested in, you know, Jesse's shirt. You know, what's interesting about it? What mm-hmm. is that? Like, I, like, I'm dumb. I don't know what it is. I never tell yeah. Superman. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that kind of conversational approach. And then you can find out more. And then you find out where the where are the clues to the to the real interest and how do I link that back to reality in the way that I mean the whole group can benefit from from something like that. Yeah, and the way you know it's interesting that you just say you don't you also you don't want to like push down and get rid of the family dynamic because it just it just hit me like you know in today's age people believe all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff, you know. So who knows what a child can come into the classroom with and say, well, did you know this? And, and, you know, we, in our days of wanting to tell people how wrong their ideas are, you know, on whatever side you I can imagine a teacher being like, oh, well, that's not true. You oh, know, as, you know yeah. what, cause I'm sure you've experienced that a child comes in, Oh, I love so-and-so in politics. Or did you know that, you know, this medicine will cure all the diseases or something? Who knows what the mom or dad was doing at home? Right. You know? Right. I know. So, well, I, I got I classic example. Two boys came up to me Two, I think they were, might've been five good, you know, good friends, whatever. Everybody gets along well, but anyway, these two boys come up and they say, we're having an argument. And I said, Oh, and he said, yeah, can you help us? You know, we were this, this is not exactly as literal as they said it, but anyway, basically they were having an argument because they were from two different family cultures. And one of them said, there's a God. Mm -hmm. And the other one said, there is no God. And that was their argument. And I, they asked me to solve it for them. I'm not uh, touching yeah. that with a 10 <laughs> foot pole. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. is part of their family culture. And it is not for me to judge that. Um, I might agree. That's a really interesting conversation. I think a lot of people have that conversation. They have different ideas about it. But the best place for each of you to learn more about this is to talk to your own parents about it. Mm. You yeah. know? And just, just, you know, just set the limit right there, but also agreeing, you know, they're, they're really perplexed because they're finding in each other things that are, um, you know, contradictory. Yeah. Um, it's just like, yeah. Uh, what a microcosm of our own world where, you know, if, if you don't have some kind of conflict, you don't really have growth because, you know, you got, oh, do I agree with this? Do I don't agree with this? You know, what does my teacher think? What are my parents? So it's just a, I don't know. I think the Montessori classroom has a lot of that. And that's why we try to have different cultures, different, just everything in there. Yeah. So that you just yeah. get all this experience, you know, not just one experience. Yeah. And I think to let in a world like the United States in particular, um, we, we, we cannot just give the message that there is only one way. Yeah. Um, I don't feel now someone could have a school that is all people from a particular culture, particular, you know, religion, whatever. But if I'm teaching, you know, in a, um, you know, a typical United States classroom where people are from all different backgrounds, uh, I cannot give the impression there is only one way of anything. So for example, in we, we used to do the winter holiday was the celebration of light. Mm-hmm. And we, we would from Thanksgiving until um, the winter break, we would do all kinds of um, artifacts and things and projects and stories related to all the different kinds of celebrations of light that have uh, that are, are have humans have created. Um, I had a whole a whole thing that I did. It was a whole like almost curriculum that I created. But you know, we had we ended up with Hanukkah candles and uh, an Advent wreath and the Diwali lamps. Um, the children of the five-year-olds every year would make some Diwali lamps. And, you know, and, and by the time the winter break came, we would have all of these things and all of these stories, the different ways that humans have celebrated this fact that it gets really dark in the winter mm. <laughs> and we don't know if the light's coming back, <laughs> but then we reach this point where the light starts to come back and we say, well, let's have a party. we got to celebrate. Yeah. And Jenny, I just connected with fantasy. It's just, I know, you know every time Christmas comes around, there's a huge debate around oh, yeah. Santa Claus. So I don't, I don't want to get into the right versus wrong with Santa yeah. Claus and Montessori. I, I've actually seen two different quotes of hers that seem somewhat contradictory in terms of how Maria Montessori even dealt with Santa Claus. But yeah. I, the, the kind of thing that just popped my mind is like, um, you know, we had, because 
get like leprechauns. You know, you think about huh. what's coming up with St. Patty's Day. Yes. So if I think about children in most classrooms, it's like green everywhere and there's leprechauns and pots of gold, over, you know, and yeah. I just think, just thinking of myself, like, oh yeah, I remember that. There's something saying, what's St. Patty's Day? Oh, there's leprechauns, gold, yeah. you know, this gold, gold. But how many children know like, oh, what's the capital of um, Ireland? Or what's, you know, yes. what is the geography like in Ireland? Or as you said, well, when it's winter time in Ireland, why is it so cold? But, you know, in Florida here in winter time, it's not as cold. Exactly. You know, like just, so like so much that we're lacking of just about the world, but we know these fantastic things that some adult has come up with. Right. Yeah. Um, I have another great example, I think. Yeah. So it was an era when Pirates of the Caribbean was all the rage. And apparently people were sharing those films with quite young children. And mm -hmm. so I was hearing from a lot of teachers that children are coming in and all they want to talk about is the pirates, pirates in the Caribbean. And what should they do? So I'm like, well, um, listen to them, find out what they know. <laughs> if they, if you see them starting to like, I'm sure they're probably pretending to be pirates. I don't know. Here's some things we could do within our range. Okay, listen to them, find out what they know, be neutral, absolutely neutral, um, and then start picking up on the links. So um, geography and language are great outlets for this. So where is the Caribbean? What else oh. is there? You could create and you could create a picture folder of all kinds of things about the about that part of the world and what's going on there. Um, there's islands there. So you can pick up stuff yeah. more on about islands, you know, from our land and water forms. Yeah. Um, you can create a set of cards with types of sailing ships. You know, they, 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 they are on these sh ships that don't use power, you know, that use the wind. Wow. What, that's an amazing thing to explore. How do you, how do you get wind to move a ship, you know, and parts of the sailing ship and maybe even clothing from that era with its special vocabulary have cards. And you just start oh, like expanding. So exciting for everything. Time. Yes, it is exciting. Suddenly yeah. this thing that you think is a threat and a distraction yeah. is a leaping point for building on a child's it. interests. That's what we do. <laughs> and you turn you, Jenny, what you just did is you turned around this kind of like hot debate, like, oh no, they shouldn't have this in the classroom and this other No, let them be children and be free. To like, oh, let's let's make this enjoyable for everybody. We don't need to, you know, we need a squasher or we don't need to like turn this into some it's fantasy time, children, you know. <laughs> I love yeah. it. And that's and that's the thing is we are constantly looking for those clues of what interest is. Yeah. And um, the only reason a child does anything, the uh, only reason a human does anything is that they're interested. And so we cannot, we can't impose interest. We have to invite it. We have to build on it. And then we create in that building, we create new interests um, or we just sort of satisfy it and it sort of dissipates and let's move on to something else. Yeah. Um, but we have to trust too, that this young child wants the real world. I wonder how much is like, you know, it sound kind of <laughs> bad, but like, it's just lethargy on our part. It's so easy to like Halloween. Maybe it's so easy to just be like, oh, well, on Halloween, we just dress up and it's very simple versus like, can we learn something new about mm -hmm. like, cause I know my wife, when we were here, I was thinking, oh, we don't have Halloween in our little schoolhouse. Um, cause it's another hot topic, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Halloween. Yeah. yeah. And she just decided to carve a pumpkin, but not just carve it, like open it and then do parts of a pumpkin. Absolutely. And, and yes. I was just amazed that like, even myself, when you lay out the parts of something very simple, you realize, well, there might be a part that you don't even know as an adult, you know, yeah. and, it, and it's such a, and then everybody's learning. So you turn something that was like a conflict into something that's just beautiful learning about the world. But yes. I wonder why, I, I feel like maybe in today's age, we kind of gravitate towards kind of contentious things. So uh, <laughs> we, we want to have a position. Or maybe, I mean, Jenny, this, I definitely want to ask you because you, you've been in it for so long. I know it's contentious and I know I've interacted with a lot of heads of school and a lot of teachers that would rather not even have to deal with the issues because it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. What do you tell teachers and admin, practically speaking, let's say backpacks in the classroom. I know I've had a teacher once like, there's no Disney characters. There's no Marvel mm -hmm. characters on children's backpacks in our school, like mm -hmm. that type of thing. How do you deal with the kind of practical reality of children bringing in fantasy into the school in which 
we don't want to be pushing adult fantasy and how do you deal with that in a I, this, is, this is a really good good question <laughs> if you want the children's backpacks to be of a certain type then I would say the school should provide the backpacks free of charge. Just say, oh, we're going to give backpacks to for each child in the class. And that way you have, if you want that control, that's a way to do it. And the parents don't have to go buy one, you know, so that that's, I mean, that's sort of an extreme example, but otherwise you can talk about keeping things simple with parents and why, um, you know, things can be distracting, you know, you can make suggestions, but I don't, I just, I just don't think we should be imposing it. And also it implies that children can't ever tell the difference that they will never tell the difference between what's distracting and what isn't. Um, let me give an ex other example because um, a child might bring a book in and it's one of their favorite books from home and they, they want to share it. And I just made it really clear, like, oh, if you bring a book in, I would love to see it. And I would look at it with the child and, and I would, you know, we would sort of, the child and I would enjoy it, you know, tell me what you know about this and how, how what is it you like about this and all of that. We'd have this wonderful conversation about it. And then uh, if I felt that it was something that I would type a story, I would share with the whole group. I'd say, I'd love to read this later. Um, would that be okay to the to some of the other children? But if it's a book that I am not wanting to share, mm -hmm. you know, it's all it's Disney all over or whatever, I would just say, thank you so much for sharing this. And I always had this big basket up on a very high shelf in my in our room where if a child did bring something from home that isn't really for sharing with everyone, they brought their stuffed animal or their blanket or you know, a bottle or, or this yeah. book, you know, it would just be like, oh, you know, that, that made me tell me about this. Oh, that you like, you feel good when it's here. And then I would say, we're going to put it in this basket and it's going to be right up here. And when you leave today, you know, you can take it home with you mm -hmm. and, and then you'll have it at home again. Um, and I would sometimes even see a child kind of go over and stand and sort of gaze up at the basket every once in a while, like that's where yeah. my stuff is. Um, but, you know, if you just do it in this sort of way, I, I never had anybody object or cry or anything. Or And then um, it would be like, oh, let's make sure you take your blanket home with you. And, you know, it's probably best if the blanket either waits for you in the car mm -hmm. every day, or if it's just at home waiting for you on your bed, because that's where it's, that's where it's, you know, safest. So let me, uh, Jenny, let me give you a hard one. So Miss Jenny, but why did you, but you read so Sophia's book two days ago and you, now you're not reading my book. Uh, yeah, you're right. I did. Um, it was a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and I have to tell you a story about this. So one year I had these incredibly mature fourth years. Mm -hmm. um, they were all, I mean, second playing characteristics of the wazoo. So for Halloween, I decided let's, let's do something different. So in late in the afternoon, it was just extended day. I only had them, um, you know, we, we turned the lights down and we all sat and I read them this incredible story, a Chinese, it's a beautiful Chinese picture book. And it's a, a story that involves hunting a dragon and it's i mean it's but it's just gorgeous and these are like six-year-olds right we're talking about four, yeah six they're all like late five or six-year-olds but they're all and they're all definitely showing second playing characteristics and so i you know i read this story and i'm showing them pictures and they were just totally captivated <laughs> and when i finished it and i'm you know closed the book and i said wow you know what'd you think <laughs> this one boy goes you wouldn't read that in the morning would you Wow. So they yeah, knew. That's mature. Yeah, that's the maturity yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah, he yeah. knew. He knew. Yeah. And I was just like, wow. You know, if yeah. you just live this, they absorb what it is, but they don't absorb it with your judgment. You're not telling yeah. them it's good or bad. You're good or bad. We're not telling you that you're, you know, Sophia was so good for bringing that book. And yes. For bringing yeah, we book. don't we don't read this in our schools yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it's more like sometimes I get to read the book and sometimes it doesn't get yeah. read. And that's just yep. the way it is. So what 
I mean, now with all of this kind of coming, I, I know I've experienced dads, usually it's a dad, but let's, let's say it could be on the mom too, but it's almost always a dad when I've experienced it. Is that like, mm-hmm. somebody will say like, what's the big deal? Like I grew up watching all sorts of Disney stuff, you know, since I was, I don't know, three, four or five, who knows how young I was and yeah. look at me, I turned out fine. <laughs> what, what's the big deal, Jenny? <laughs> Um, well, and not to treat the adult like a child, I treat all humans this way. I would also come with the, you know, like, um, yeah, you're right. You know, we all have similar experiences to share. I remember, you know, things that I saw, um, you know, it's just part of our culture, isn't it? And so I don't want to imply any judgment of any kind of their parenting or how they turned out or the culture they embrace. But then I would try to guide the conversation to other aspects of what a child experiences in life and when they experience it and how it relates to their stage of development. Um, I think, um, actually, I think diet is a good analogy. So no one would argue with the importance of a well-balanced, nutritious diet, you know, maximum support for healthy physical and mental development at the child's particular age, the younger the child, the more important you know, the nutrition is, maybe we could think of the sort of fantastical, you know, Disney stuff, like sugars and sweets in a diet, you know, for a young child, some is probably okay, but we want to keep them in proportion. We don't want to have them eating a diet that's only sugar and sweets. Uh, Based on that was going to leave out important components of what they need. And so maybe the stories and the images we share with the children, you know, we'd want to have just more variety uh, rather than, so anyway, I don't know if that that helps. It's, it's just sort of like, I I wonder how much is, you know, with us as adults, we have such nostalgia for some of the things that we had as children. So we, and then, and then we put it on the child. Oh no, they love such and such. It's like, yeah, because if, if you love it and you're presenting it to them with just this over i mean this gushing of just like oh i as a child i would sit in my yeah. mom's arms and watch yeah. you know bambi it's like they're gonna yeah. they're of course they're gonna love it beyond you know because they're absorbing from you yeah i love that stuff. it's but whatever you share with your child they're gonna love it's not just yeah. the fantasy and so just like you know ideally they're gonna like you know the other aspects of a healthy diet and not just you know the sweet yeah. um it can be a special treat yeah, maybe, but you don't tell them it's a special treat. It's just like you just like today just we're going to do this. Yeah. But I think that helping parents feel feel good about whatever they share with their children. Yeah, um, that the child just you know that's what they they're craving just that that time and that relationship and the quality of time. Um, yeah. and of course, as the child gets older, what I would also tell the parent is, you know, as they begin to sort out reality, because remember, it's this idea of do you know whether this is really possible, whether mm-hmm. you can really jump out of a window and, and survive. Um, as the child gets older, you'll be able to share more and more things of this type with them. Yeah, It's just really about, you know, their vulnerability when they're young. And as yeah. they get older, it can actually become something you really enjoy together. Yeah. I like, and I like your old framework because it's very, it's, you know, you're making a judgment about, Hey, we should be show, doing reality first, but you're not judging the person or the parent. It's not this moral condemnation or, you know, praise for somebody because, Oh, you, I love how you're only doing reality at home. What a Montessorian you are. You know, like that's not, that's not your approach, which. No, um, no. And in fact, actually it's okay. I'm not going to do any fantasy in my classroom or aspects of culture that some people might call fantasy, depending on like, you know, their perspective, but I'm not going to be doing any of that in my classroom. So it's okay. They can do it at home. You know, what I would be looking for is the child who gets lost in fantasy because I think, and Montessori talks about this also. I know it's in the secret of childhood, at least in one place she does that, that fantasy can be a defense uh, that the yeah. child creates and they can, you know, it's a refuge, they flee into fantasy or they create a barrier. Um, like Montessori talks about deviations, you know, like fantasy can be a sign. There is something this child feels they need to defend themselves against, protect themselves against in their world. And that I would want to be alert to. And yeah. and, I would, and I, that's where, you know, 
they can be challenging conversations, but they're important conversations to have. What is going on in this child's life that they are fleeing into fantasy? Yeah, the escape. They yeah, and I think just you know, hearing you say that just it brings up these, I mean, these horrible school shootings. I just think how many of these yeah. children cl- probably showed incredible signs of being in the fantasy land, not oh, yeah. being in the world. But of course, it's easier to kind of go, oh, well, push it away or suspend somebody, but not really delve into, okay, something's up here. Yeah. You know? So maybe I want to, I want to ask a question. I'm going to jump off that. I just went a little bit, <laughs> a little too. I mean, it's real, but it's a little deep, but I, yes. something that's very practical and comes up a lot with parents and teachers is, and we're talking about fantasies. What about the kind of, I don't know if it's a fantasy or a story or even the lying that children, you know, like, I don't know. I went to a zoo last week with my mom. I saw a flying zebra. You, I wish you were there, Mrs. Jenny or something, <laughs> you know, like how do yes. you, how do you deal with that? You know, it's somewhat related to fantasy, but it almost seems like the child, you know, I, I know parents go, oh, my, why is my child lying so much? Or the teacher's yeah. like, they're always telling these stories. And I'm like, I can't even tell what's true and false anymore. So right. what, what do you do with that right. with the child? Um, well, one thing that I do to calm myself down about that thought is that young children really can't lie. Uh, mm-hmm. Lying is a very intentional thing. And again, it's like knowing the difference between what's real and what isn't real. Um, so I, I don't like to think of it as lying. But, you know, children could come in with this story, you know, that what sounds like a pretty fantastical story, like the flying pig. Um, they can go in the other direction. They could go home and say something um, about stuff that happened at school <laughs> that didn't mm-hmm. happen. It would be disturbing to the parent, like somebody hit me or whatever. I'll tell you, I the first time I had a meeting with parents when their child was about to start in the and before the child started in the environment, I would have a meeting with with um each set of parents. And one of the things I would do during that meeting, I would sort of jokingly say, okay, look, let's, can we make an agreement? Um, I'll believe half of what your child tells me about you and your family, if you will believe half of what your child tells you about us here. And it usually created sort of a little laugh and, you know, like, oh, kind of, you know, it's the same. And then we would, that would then introduce this possibility that a child might misrepresent reality uh, in either direction. And that opened the door to sort of talk strategy with the parents uh, for how to respond. Um, Now, if a child came in and was talking about the flying pig with me, you know, we already know what I would be doing. I'd be like, oh, tell me more. Oh, where was the pig? How did this happen? You know, um, and, you know, help sort of give the parents that that technique a little bit, too. Um, Now, if it's, you know, a flying pig, eh, we'll see, you know, (laughs) where we might what that might end up with. Um, Sometimes uh, another really uh, helpful Thing to say was, and I've seen this work really well. It's like, um, so if I, you know, you said you're, you were with your mom at the zoo. Yes. If I asked your mom about the flying pig, would she tell me? Mm. Would she agree? Um, or similarly, if I ask your teacher about that, would, would, you know, your teacher agree that that had happened? I have seen young children immediately pull back on a story as soon as this is asked. If they, they, do this kind of funny grin and conspiratorial, oh no, you know, and so that they know that it didn't really happen. And it's just a story they're making up. Um, And so, so there, there is that. Um, Another way I sometimes respond to that is, is that something you wish would happen in your family or, um, you know, like maybe a child goes home and says that somebody hit them. Um, and it's just like, are you afraid of getting hurt at school? Um, you know, it's just like, just, just again, that just tell me more. What is it that's provoking this yeah. story? It's not just this, coming out of nowhere. Man, this tell me more. I know we're talking about children, but it just it keeps hitting me of like, when somebody's coming at you with some story or some, you know, oh, this is a miracle drug. This will cure all. Or the, the left is, you know, ruining the country or the right is going to, it's like, oh, tell me more about that. Could you imagine? I, I use tell me more at every age. It yeah, is the there way. you go. Because it's yeah. like you're gonna you're you're gonna get to something that's more important than just what's on the surface. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and again, you know, we it's this child, this particular child, 
not every child. That's, mm-hmm. I have to know the child. I have to be, I have to be creative all the time. It's a great yeah. job. Really I great feel- job. I do feel like, I mean, I've said this multiple times in different episodes, but I feel like we're get, we're in a culture that more and more wants the answer for everybody, you know? And it's yeah. like, what you just came back to is, hey, well, we're in this profession. It's dealing with individual human beings. You got to, you know, what's being presented to you? <laughs> you know, there is no, this is exactly what you say to any human being, whatever age walks up to you, except for tell me more. I think tell me more is universal. You can yeah. use <laughs> Well, and that's the thing. We have this incredible, as we should never stop learning about our our educational approach either, because mm-hmm. there is so much there that, that to give us these guidelines. But we are humans. We are we have much more in common, no matter what we look like, where we live, what mm-hmm. culture we're in, what we believe, how you know, we have more in common and hardly anything that really distinguishes us one from the other. And so there are these universals, you know, we all want to be believed. We all want to be uh, honored. We all want to be valued. We all want to feel, um, you know, that, that um, love it's love, you know, for you, but the point, and then everybody else does too. So we have this whole educational approach that helps children at a very young age totally come to terms and come to accept and embrace. We are all, we all have this in common. We all are the same. And then the differences are just these wonderful, um, you know, like how we dress, how we wear our hair, you know, what kinds of furniture we, I mean, like whatever, that's just, that's just little details um, that make life so interesting, you know, and what we eat and how we prepare. Yeah. So I think if we take that approach, we will see that everything in our environments pretty much is there for us to launch from. Yeah. And I, th- that, I think I learned that, you know, it being years in Montessori that we've got these universals, we have our albums that, that offer some real like universal truths of all children, then it's your work to, you know, apply that or utilize that with the individuals in front of you, you know, yeah. Jenny, Sarah, Sophia, whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I agree. I'm happy you're pointing out that there are universals to all of us as human beings, but it's, you know, it's our work to integrate that with individuals. Um, so do you, yeah. is there, is there anything, I mean, I know we covered a tremendous amount. And again, I think in the start of this fantasy is not the easiest topic. And it's probably why it's not really dissected that often because it's, it's challenging. Is there anything else, you know, on fantasy, pretend play, quote, lying story, anything you, or even beyond that, that you'd like to say before we hop out of here? Oh gosh, probably you've just stimulated a lot of, (laughs) but uh, it's a huge topic. Mm -hmm. I do think that one of the things I would say to parents and educators is to, to relax, Mm -hmm. just relax other than the deviation type situation where the child is truly you know, fleeing from something dangerous in their life. Just, you know, just relax, see our role is to offer maybe a positive counterbalance to the fantastical influences in culture and and trust our approach that it, it will, it will give us means to channel if we feel it's needed, what the child is coming in with. Um, But get, you know, not be judgmental, be very neutral um, with children and very, but very empathetic, you know, be a listener, um, ask those questions and just sort of get, get things going, uh, before we leap to some sort of, we don't want to leap to judgment, mm-hmm. whether it's of parents or of the child. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, one of the imagination, like I said, is being created in the first plane and the other, the other power of that's being created in the first plane is reason. And so reason and critical thinking are also a partner of of the imagination. And we, I I would love for us to trust that we can support both of those. We don't have to Mm -hmm. diminish the imagination by keeping children in touch with reality and develop the skills of reasoning and critical thinking um, as a vital power for the rest of their lives. 
if we get too hung up on the fantasy part, you know, let, let's also keep it balanced with this idea that we are supporting the development of an imagination uh, for children. And we humans depend on our imagination, science, creation, you know, artistic, whatever it is we're doing, it's all launching from our imaginations. Um, and there are things that people can imagine today that if they were imagined a thousand years ago would not have been possible in reality. Yeah. And today we can imagine incredible things that, that they couldn't have imagined that they would have said yeah. was fantasy. And so it's, it's just ever evolving for us as humans, what our imaginations do. And we want to support and cultivate that, but we want to help children develop the skills to distinguish what is possible and probable in our world and what isn't and oh i'm fantasizing here and i'm not going to jump out the window and think i can fly yeah I, I i'm so happy and i love that you ended on that because i don't want it to seem like oh we're a montessori in any ways anti-fantasy but you've kind mm -hmm. of you really hit it at the end here that if they have a huge base and in, in reality that's the stuff with which you are incredibly creative or imaginative yes. um so I, I appreciate your ending on that like imagination is what we're all about as humans. Creativity is what we're all about. Computers, Absolutely. computers have data points. We do stuff right. with the data, with the knowledge. Right. So, well, thank you so much, Ginny. As always, you are you are the wise one. <laughs> I mean, so many more episodes than anybody else on this show. So, uh, always appreciate you coming on. You're a wealth of information. I love it. it's for parents and teachers and and me myself. Well, so, thank you. Th thank you for the opportunity and um. Uh, I, I keep learning too. <laughs> yeah. Well, good stuff, Jenny. And uh, we'll talk again. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Coming out of that discussion with Jenny Sackett, I am not going to add much. I've just got two quick notes for you. One, uh, I have a quote about fantasy that I have always loved. It comes from a biographer of Maria Montessori named E.M. Standing. And actually, he himself was quoting another person, and that's the late children's author, G.K. Chesterton. I think I'm getting that right. Yeah, Chesterton. And he said, quote, when we are very young, we do not need fairy tales. Mere life is interesting enough. A child of seven is excited by being told that Tommy opened the door and saw a dragon. But a child of three is excited by being told that Tommy opened a door. End of quote. So I think you get the point there. But I mean, the natural world, just our reality has so much to offer children. We need to give it to them first, this young children, before we go giving them our fantastic creations about the world, right? Anyways, not much more to keep going on that. That's what we just had a whole conversation about. But I thought that quote, I've always thought that quote is awesome. And I wanted to share it with you. So second point, and this is just another big thanks to the wonderful, the wise, Jenny Sackett. I love talking with her. And let me tell you guys, I actually love maybe even more, but I do love the actual conversation, our pre-conversations, which, you know, you guys don't hear. And that's because we get very real with one another. So we have differing opinions on different things. And then usually we agree on most everything, but we talk off the record, you know, on all sorts of topics. So I'm noting this because I am thinking of bringing some of our future conversations on the record. So talking about any and all topics that might come to mind. Now, it's going to be related to children, but it's just this type of stuff that, you know, maybe sometimes people aren't raising because they're a little bit scared of, you know, the culture, and especially in America, either way, politically, socially, anything. Uh, and I'm interested in what you listeners want to talk about that maybe hasn't been talked about before, because, you know, it's a little contentious. So I'm going to try to get Ginny on the show to do a little kind of Q&A with the two of us. Uh, and where nothing is off the table, like any questions are, are open to discussion. So let me know what you think about that and, uh, see if we can get that out. All right. That is it. Thank you for being on board with us. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it, please, please. You can subscribe to the show. Of course, Apple, Spotify, I don't know, whatever podcast player you got, go for it. And now, especially on YouTube, as I am posting more videos nowadays, so get on it and leave reviews, you guys, please. I want to hear from you. It's good for the show. Get on that. That's it. Take care, everyone. Uh, until next time, adios.